So a potential juror at the second degree murder trial of George Zimmerman didn't mince words when she asked if she thought George Zimmerman was guilty or innocent. The woman, who was only known as Juror E81, came right out and said she thought Zimmerman should not be on trial and that she thought he should go home. Do you believe he's innocent? I do. Okay. Now, despite that, you said you can set that aside? If there was evidence that shown, that proved to me that he did indeed commit a crime, I mean, I think he was just defending himself. Okay. And you came to that conclusion just based on what you saw in the media, correct? Yes. Okay. And so as a result, you believe he's innocent? I do. Today is the fourth day of jury selection. George Zimmerman has pleaded not guilty in the shooting death of 17-year-old Trayvon Martin last year. He claimed self-defense. Martin was unarmed. NBC's Carrie Sanders is in Sanford, Florida with more. And Carrie, we understand the judge just made some news of her own. She announced how long this trial is going to last and what's going to happen to those jurors if they are impaneled. So first of all, how long will the trial last? According to the lawyers, it's going to last two to four weeks, which is shorter than what was initially discussed of a six or maybe even longer week trial. The other real significant news is that the jurors who are impaneled, and remember, this is a six-person jury with alternates, they will be sequestered, which means that they will have to stay in a hotel, they won't go home, they won't sleep in their own beds, and as we've heard some of the jurors coming on the stand and talking about the uh, hardships associated with this, that becomes a challenge because some people, as we've heard, have children at home, don't have family in the area, and are unsure how they would be able to provide child care if they are sequestered. So that is going to be a stumbling block, but now we know definitely there will be the jury plus the alternates sequestered. Now, as we've heard today, we've heard some rather direct comments from some of the uh, potential jurors here, including that one woman who we heard from earlier who had said that she had already reached a conclusion in her mind based on the facts that she had heard from listening to television, reading newspapers, looking on the internet. It's interesting because both the prosecution and the defense have strongly indicated in their conversations that these are not facts, these are pieces of information that she's gathered. And as an example, you you can hear what she said when she talked about yet one more thing that she characterized as a fact. I know that that he was learning how to be a street fighter. And who was learning how to be Trayvon a was. And where did you come to that conclusion? Just from the news. What's, what news do you remember specifically saying that Trayvon was learning to be a street fighter? Well, nobody directly said that. It was just pictures that they'd shown. And of course, this is the challenge now for the lawyers on both sides to find those who have not reached a conclusion, uh, basically in a case that has had media saturation, and not just locally, but nationally. And so they're working slowly, methodically. They uh, are on number 29 in terms of the people who they're actually speaking to that they brought in. Remember, they gave questionnaires to uh, 200 of the 500 who've been summoned, had them fill out the questionnaires, and they went through those and dismissed some of those outright just based on some of the things that they said. So uh, the goal is to get 30 who can then be brought back into the courtroom and then they can go into more extensive questioning with those 30 to see whether they can reach the, the, the number needed here, which is six plus the alternates. Thomas? Kerry Sanders reporting for us in Sanford. Kerry, thanks so much. Uh, joining me right sure. now is the criminal defense attorney, John Burris. We should also note, though, that George Zimmerman has sued NBC Universal, the parent company of this network, uh, for defamation. The company strongly denies those allegations. So, John, you were able to hear exactly what Kerry was reporting there and also hear about the juror and the impressions that she has formed over the trial coverage and her impressions of Trayvon. Uh, who does it behoove, the, the prosecution or the defense for low information jurors? Well, at this stage, I, I think that uh, it, would, it would help either side if they got jurors who did not already have a preconceived notion about the case. This is an example, though, of why you have to do these jurors individually, uh, because if you had other people in that panel and they heard this testimony, they could be prejudiced. And, and so this is a case where uh, jurors all can be impacted uh, by pretrial publicity, and they can fall down on either side of the table. So here, I think each lawyer set has to work very hard to try to ferret out as best they can these strong opinions held by individuals. Uh, we wanted to talk about juror E50 and the personal loss that this juror revealed under questioning. Take a listen. 
do you feel that uh, that was a long thing that they got up and talked to the media? Did you think that? Uh, being a person who also has lost the child, uh, I'm you know, sorry about my that. son also, um, I can see why they would do that. <laughs> it helps to get it off your chest, yes. Can you not factor in the, the death of your child in relation to this case? Can you keep that out of the equation? Of course, yes. Yeah. So that was juror E50, and he called Trayvon shooting a shame for both families. Said he doesn't watch court hearings on TV. Said that there's boring. He remembered the case as an incident, and also recalled the protests that followed. So, what is the benchmark, John, that the lawyers are going to be looking for? As Kerry said, to try to reach that 30 number, because obviously, people, unless they're truly living under a rock, are going to have some or had some exposure in Sanford, in Florida, to this case. No question about it. Everyone has had that, and I, I think a juror like this who basically has said he has lost someone that could make the defense kind of nervous uh, about him but on the other hand he could say easily say he could put that aside and and, and set it with a certain level of conviction so mm -hmm. what, what you're really looking for is people even if they've heard it even if they have some opinion about the facts they are not wedded to those facts and they can put those facts aside even though even though they might seem on his face but certainly uh, lawyers are looking to see if you believe them when they say that and this is a juror I think you could believe that uh, at the time. At the end of the day, though, he'll be part of 30, and you're looking for compositions, you're looking for leaders, you're looking for people with followers, and so this is just the first step. I think that person pr could probably stay within that pool. John, and I know uh, that you're, you're not associated with this case, but just from cases that you've seen <coughs> in the past, how easy is it to read if jurors are kind of giving you some white lies, whether or not that they <laughs> want to be on this jury or not? I mean, some well, people might I, I, say that they've, you know, they've heard everything and they've already formed an opinion because they just don't want any part of this. Well, I'll tell you, this is one of these tea leaf questions that lawyers engage in all the time because you're looking at people, they're giving you facts and information. Yeah. You kind of want to know, for me, you know, what, what their political issues are around, who do they see, what are, they, are they supervisors, are they decision makers, uh, are they followers? Those are the kind of things I'm looking for, even more so than what they say, because you can be misled by comments that they make and so lawyers are always looking sometimes you have uh, I certainly have had uh, uh, consultants to help with this process uh, that uh, who've looked at a lot more jurors perhaps than I have and so it's definitely an art <laughs> it is not yeah. scientific and you're really kind of uh, trying to read human beings as best you can you need to know a lot about what people do you know what kind of programs do they watch on television you know that tells you a lot about their beliefs and that's what the examination part is about to try to explore those particular issues and then without revealing your real thoughts about it to kind of put that behind you because how whatever you see the other lawyer sees as well so there's a lot there's a lot of strategy uh, involved amongst the lawyers in terms of trying to get as much as they can without revealing what their true feelings are about it to some extent um, jurors do that as well but some jurors are, are very open about it like the two people we've just had discussions about fascinating uh, choreography that's going on right there Criminal defense attorney John Burris John thanks for your time I appreciate it thank you